You are watching a socially good TV special presentation. I would like to introduce uh, our keynote, Mr. Luke Visconti. Luke is the founder and chairman and former CEO of Diversity Inc. He just recently retired from that. And actually, Luke started that business from uh, the ground up. And over the course of his entrepreneurial career, Luke has positioned himself as an expert on diversity and inclusion. Luke launched Diversity Inc. as a website in 1997 when he realized that corporate leaders were beginning to understand the impact inclusion or the lack thereof could have on their companies. And simultaneously, those leaders, they didn't have the information or the resources to compare their work with their peers to support or share best practices and transfer ideas. Since that start, it is, uh, Diversity Inc. has gone on to become a, a, a leading print and online publication focused on the issues of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. He further grew the company into a successful benchmarking consulting business, at, and it produces diversity conference events, including the coveted annual Diversity Inc. Top 50 conference that's now in its 16th year. Luke now, he spends much time speaking on the topic of inclusion, and while uh, we were uh, putting together, getting him to come here, he's really into reading a lot of books. He said he might go into just doing book reviews because he's reading all this information, and, and he's focused on the importance of leadership in an inclusive strategy, and we are very excited to have Luke here today with us to expand upon the content that we've received this morning. So please, let's give a warm welcome, Akron welcome, to Mr. Luke Visconti. Get that. One of the projects I'm working on is economic development and chambers of commerce in cities that need to grow. So I want to start you with a quote from Professor Enrico Moretti, and I'll be talking about his book in a little bit. In the coming decades, successful societies will be the ones that can attract and nurture the most creative workers and entrepreneurs. I'm going to get into this a little bit more. Next, oh, I got the, there we go. So how did I get here? I was a Navy pilot. I have a biology degree from Rutgers University. I applied to the Navy flight program when I was a sophomore. The second I graduated, I was down in Pensacola. At the time, the commissioning program was run by the Marines, so I had a Marine Corps drill instructor. I uh, flew in the fleet, and then after my fleet tour was over, I volunteered for recruiting duty because the Cold War was over and I wanted to get back to the United States. So the way the math works is you get to ask what you want to do, and then you get to ask where you want to do it. So I knew that I needed to get back to a major city, and I also knew that I hate winter. So I asked for Southern California, I asked for Dallas, I asked for Atlanta, I asked for Miami, and this was 1987. So there were no fax machines, no email, no text messages, nothing. I'm waiting for my little envelope on Guam. I was stationed on Guam. I get it, I open it up, I've got orders to New Jersey. So <laughs> I booked an appointment with the guy who detailed the orders, and I flew all the way to Washington in the back of a cargo plane, and I sat down in, in the Navy annex with him, and he said, look, you're from New Jersey. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, you don't think anybody who's not from New Jersey is asking you to go there, do you? And I said, <laughs> good logic, I said, no. And he goes, that's why you're going to New Jersey. So all right, okay. So I go to New Jersey, and on my way, I was driving across country with my wife. I called up my new boss, who I had never met in person. And I said, look, XO, I'm on my way. I just wanted to say hello. And she said, I'm so glad you called because I've got something you need to think about. You don't have to answer me today. Which in the Navy, that's very alarming when your boss says that because it usually means you're going to fly one way to some place where you're going to get shot to pieces. So I said, okay. And she goes, we need a new minority officer recruiter. So I said, you know, XO, I don't even need to think about it. I'll take the job. And so she breathed a sigh of relief, which told me she was having trouble filling that job. I go to my training. I go up to New Jersey. And I'm introducing myself around the office. And in one of the offices, there's a black pilot. Now, his name's Tony Cato. I didn't expect to see another pilot. There's usually just one in every district. So I went in, I was like, wow, this is great, how are you? And he was there temporarily, he was finishing his MBA, he had resigned his commission, he was leaving the Navy. So he asked me, well, what are you here to do? And I said, well, I'm the new minority officer recruiter. 
And he sat back in his chair and he folded his arms and he said, I guess you were the best they could do. And so I said, gee, Tony, thanks a bunch. And he goes, well, that wasn't very nice. He goes, would you like my help? And I said, yeah, I'd love your help. So we went together on trips to go talk to people and meet people. And he would tell me about his, himself. He's a natural born professor. He would tell me about his life and, and about his experiences. He grew up in the projects in Baltimore. He went to the Naval Academy. He's been married to his wife, Barbara, for over 30 years now, probably closer to 40. He's raised two successful boys. They're now men and doing very well. Um, but at the time, they were little boys. And, and he would talk about his family and his wife and about his career. And, and it was, he was just this engaging, completely credible man to me. He was also, he would tell me about ways he had been discriminated against. And my reaction to those stories was, oh, come on, Tony, it couldn't have been that bad, or they must not have meant it that way, or how often could that thing possibly happen? Well, one day we were driving across the Tappan Zee Bridge talking about what we like to do in the car on long drives. Now, we were driving in a government-issue K car, remember those? There was a squeak in the left, in the left top of the dashboard, so it would squeak in a way. We're talking about it. Now remember, there's no CD players. There's no cell phones to play with. You can't text and drive. There's no texting. There's no satellite radio. You got AM and FM, and that's about it. So he said, I have a box of Martin Luther King speeches on cassette tape in the trunk of my car, and especially if I'm feeling a little down, I'll pop in the tape. And I thought about it, because I read nothing but history. I still do. And I had no connection with Martin Luther King. And yet my friend Tony had such a deep connection with the man that he had speeches on cassette tape in the trunk of his car. So I thought, what am I missing here? I am missing something very large, and I don't understand it, and I've got to give this some thought. And it, that conversation, that very moment, changed the rest of the trajectory of my life. Tony went on to uh, go to IBM, and then he started his own business. I was at the recruiting district and um, did my recruiting. And I kept a very open mind about what I wasn't seeing. And what I learned was it's going to, and I understand you are enthusiasts. That's why you're here. If this were a fair representation of Akron business, there would be mostly white men here. There wouldn't be 50% women. I think it's mostly women here. So understand, I know I'm talking to people who are excited about this subject and excited to be here. But I had no thought in my mind about denying Tony his own experiences. What's that about? It's called white privilege. Now, when you say white privilege in an average audience, people get all upset with you and you get into arguments. I don't have any privilege. Oh, yes, you do. I was on my way to a meeting in Philadelphia with, uh, I testified to Congress uh, about a month and a half ago about the lack of diversity in financial services. And uh, Maxine Waters was chairing the committee. It was pretty exciting. And one of the other people testifying was a professor from University of Pennsylvania. So I contacted her and I said, let's have lunch. We have some research we need to do. I'd love to get your feedback on it. So on my way to Philadelphia, uh, I got twisted around, the roads aren't very well marked, and so I made an illegal U-turn and accelerated into traffic. I immediately got pulled over. So I was like, okay, I know I'm going to get a ticket. So I get my license, insurance, and registration out. The cop comes over to me. Now I have Florida license plates because I'm a resident of Florida. And he said, what'd you do? He goes, what, what, you know why I pulled you over? I said, yeah, I made an illegal U-turn, and I got back into traffic. So he said, why'd you do that? And I said, because this, the road wasn't very well marked, and I thought I could do this safely, so I did it. But I know I'm wrong. It's OK. We ended up having a small conversation. He shook my hand and sent me on my way. That's white privilege. That's white privilege. So when I got to the lunch, which was the two black women, I said, hey, I got my little white privilege today. And they laughed, and they said, well, what happened? And I told them, and they laughed, and they shook their head. So I want you to think about this. From online, and I don't know if it's entirely accurate, it might be old information, the Akron police force is 91% white, Akron is 60% white. You think the Akron police force is equally distributing those little fair deals where you go, hey, dude, you're out of state, it's okay, don't worry about it, have a nice day. I don't think so, I doubt it. If they were, wouldn't they be 60% white, the police force? If they were being fair and representing the city that they serve, 
wouldn't there be a concerted effort to make sure that the police represent the citizens? I would bet they would. I was on a trip one time to St. Louis, and my counterpart um, at the power company there, um, Sharon, took me, we, we go to dinner every time I'm in St. Louis, and she said, can I take you for a drive before we go to dinner? I said, sure. So we're driving, we get off the interstate, we're going through a modest suburb of St. Louis, nothing particularly noteworthy about it. She said, what do you think of this neighborhood? I said, it's like a million neighborhoods in this country, very nice little place. She goes, do you know where you are? And I said, let me guess, Ferguson. And she said, that's right, what do you think? And I said, looks like any place I'd see in New Jersey, looks like where I just drove through coming from the airport, just a normal lower middle class town. She said, I grew up here. So we talked about what happened in Ferguson. Do you know all these years later, the police are still in trouble in St. Louis with bad law enforcement? So we talk about white privilege. Do you want to develop the Akron of the future? So let's talk about diversity and economic development. We're going to talk about how su successful companies manage this and authentic and fair leadership. So I'm going to suggest two books for you here. The first one is Brown is the New White by Professor Steve Phillips. He's a professor at University of San Francisco. We've had him speak twice at our events. And Robert, you could distribute this presentation to everybody. You know, so you'll get a copy of this presentation. A quote from him. There are 7,000 more people of color added to the US population every single day as compared to what, just 1,000 whites through a combination of births, deaths, and legal immigration. So think about that. 8,000 people added to our population every day. Seven out of 8,000 are not white. Did you know that? I didn't. This is the other book I'd recommend you read. It's called The New Geography of Jobs. And we need to decide which America we want as our future. The America, and I put Akron, that's my putting Akron in parentheses there, of ever-increasing educational levels, rising productivity, and pragmatic optimism, or the America of deteriorating skills, shrinking horizons, and paralyzing pessimism. It's a big choice that the entire country has to make. Akron has to make it too. And I think Akron has to take accountability for that decision. You can't punt it, because it's coming at you. It's here. I read the report, you know what you have to do. Well, if you look at our country overall, and some of this, I saw the first presentation, so you've seen a little bit of this. If you're under 18, the country's 51% white. If you're under 65, the country's 58% white. If you're, under, if you're over 65, it's 81% white. Now think about this. In 2017, college graduates were 65% white. Women earned 57% of bachelor's degrees, 59% of master's degrees, and 53% of doctorate degrees. Now think about that for a minute. Women have been getting more bachelor degrees than men since the late 1980s and yet there's no very few uh, women CEOs in the Fortune 500. And we're gonna get into statistics of women executives, but I, I actually was at Toyota, and um, we were talking about women in senior management, and I said to them, the average Fortune 500 company has roughly 20% women in management, and yet 58% of four-year degree earners for people that age were women. Now, if you lost 35 percentage points of Camrys from the end of the assembly line to the dealership, what would you do today? It would be intolerable to lose 35 percentage points of anything in business. Yet, because it's women, we shrug our shoulders and go, oh, well, I guess they didn't want to do the work. Did you hear that Chuck Grassley say that about the Judicial Committee? So let's take a look at what America looks like elsewise. The 10 richest Americans are 100% white. Seven of those people are the ten, among the 10 richest in the world. Congress is 90% white, 24% women. US governor is 96% white, 18% uh, women. Fortune 500 board of directors, 86% white, 20% women. Current presidential ca uh, cabinet is 91% white, 14% women. The only thing you could deduce from these numbers is that the most talented people, mathematically, are not filling the jobs. We have gotten really good at cultivating under-deserving and under-talented white men to fill every imaginable position in this country. We're really good at it. 
this process is about enabling a more fair distribution of that care. Now, typically in one of these kinds of presentations, I used to take a picture or get a picture off the internet of the closest country club to the location. I stopped doing it because it made people extremely uncomfortable, the members of the country club. <laughs> but I would point out that the country club is a resource group for wealthy white people. That's what it's there for. So let's go into the presentation. Yesterday, or this is two days ago now, Washington Post, for the first time, new, most new working age hires are u in the U.S. are people of color. Here's the graphs. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? It crossed over. The top bar is white, non-Hispanic, and the bottom bar is Hispanic, black, and other groups. You can see we crossed over. And look at already in the workforce, you can see we're going to cross over in the not-too-distant future. I want you, if you can see it, most read business stories, um, number one there is, is We Blew It. Forbes named 99 men and only one woman on its list of most innovative leaders. Isn't that great? So you know who the editor of Forbes is and who's on the editorial staff, don't you? Not too many women, I'd imagine. Certainly none who would grab the editor and tug on his sleeve and say, dude, that's not a good look. You don't want to do this. We're going to be the number one business story on the Washington Post. Right next to the article saying that for the first time, most new, new uh, working age hires are in the U.S. are people of color. Pretty embarrassing. So we do every year for the last almost 20 years a top, fun, com, top companies for diversity competition. It is a survey. Um, there's 1,400 fields of data. It's, we measure the top four layers of management, top 10% uh, paid people in the company. We measure um, total management, total workforce, new hires. We measure turnover. We, me we, we measure everything. And from that, we develop a very metrics-driven list um, that you can see here is got all sorts of companies on it. There's, you know, AT&T is number one this year, but we have hospitality. We have banks. We have, um, you know, services companies. We have... Uh, uh, big four accounting firms, we have Accenture, we have all sorts of companies, Toyota. Um, so it's a very competitive thing. You can see on the bottom we have a Hall of Fame. I remove the number one companies from the list and put them in the Hall of Fame every year. Um, and so you can see, and I started doing that a while back, and at first the companies, because they were all in the top ten, they complained. I said, you're killing me. Nobody can get into the top ten because you guys are perennially roosting there, and you're killing my business. And I said, yeah, you're right. We'll, we, we accept the uh, Hall of Fame. So, it was, you know, but think about it. They're very proud of what they do. And think about this, too. It's all metrics driven. This is, we have a noteworthy list of companies that didn't quite make the list. So I just wanted to show you the, um, that list, the, you know, the extra list. So you can see other companies that are in there. You should know that the top 10 are far better than 40 through 50. And I'm going to show you those numbers. They're far better at this. Now this is, if you look at this concentric circle thing, the top ring is the top 10 on my list, the middle ring is the top 50, and the inside ring is US EEO numbers. So you can see the, the, the um, medium blue are, wi are um, women, um, excuse me, people of color, the light blue are women of color, and the dark blue is women. Now take a look at the difference between the EEO numbers and the top 10. We were at a conference, we have a, uh, we're going to have another one, Women of Color and Their Allies in Atlanta this fall, and one woman stood up, and um, she was, I think, working for The Gap, and she said, well, you guys are talking about all these great programs, but my company doesn't have any of these things. What do you suggest I do? Well, my CEO, Carolyn Johnson, said, um, oh, I'll take this, and she looked at the woman and said, find another job. You're not going to move the needle there. And uh, that's basically, if you're a woman, a professional woman of color, do you want to be on the outer ring or the inner ring? Think about it. Board of directors, top 10, top 50, Fortune 500. How do you think the accountability is being handed to the CEO from the board of directors? Well, if the board of directors isn't diverse, you're not going to get accountability for this kind of thing, are you? And then, these are the best practices. You can't read this, I'm going to talk about it. Um, there's three things that we found were statistically associated with top results. 
Now, I'm a believer in, you know, having great conferences and feeling good. I like that too. But at the end of the day, it's your results that matter. If you're going to tell me you've got an all-white executive team, all-white male executive team, I'm going to say your results stink, and they're not worthy of my list. But if you're going to say, I'm not going to accept anything less than 50%, and we're going to develop people to get there, and like Chris Nassetta, the CEO of Hilton, um, had seven out of nine senior vice president promotions two years ago to go to women, uh, because he has six daughters, and so he knows better when he goes home. Um, bottom line is, you can move the needle if you really want to and you're holding yourself accountable. So there's some things here. The most important by far is the Executive Diversity Committee, chaired by the CEO, and meeting monthly. And looking at metrics. That's what they do in these committee meetings. So why is that important? Well, number one, you want the CEO to be looking at the people responsible for making things happen. And I'll give you a uh, thing that happened to me it was we were benchmarking a small engineering company, about 40,000 employees. And the first year I showed them that their new hires were less diverse than their current workforce, which wasn't very diverse to begin with. And that's what happens to people. They start, you know, when, when the reputation goes out that they're not a great place to work, fewer and fewer people get hired, and, you know, people of color, and, and then your diversity goes down. So the CEO was very upset about this. And he, I could see there was going to be some changes in recruiting. So the next year I come back, and same numbers. And so I present them. They go up on this you know, big board. And so the CEO looks at the recruiting people, and they go, oh, no, 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 it's not us. We went to black engineers. We went to Hispanic engineers. We came back with great resumes. But the hiring managers, and the guy pointed across the room, did not hire any of them. So the CEO's head swivels around to the other side. By the third year, they did better. You know, but I, could, I can imagine those meetings. But if you have an executive diversity council, which is keeping track of the metrics properly, you're going to know when you're running off the rails. You're going to know when there's a problem. And the problem is always, all, it, you have to look at who's accountable. Your chief human resources officer is accountable for this stuff. So we were at a power company, big one, and the CEO was very excited about this subject because he was very interested in the connection between diversity and innovation. And if you think back to my story about Tony, well, Tony's experiences were radically different than mine. And when I listened to his experiences and I believed them, my thinking changed. It got better. And that's how I got my business started and, get, and getting it going was because he changed my thinking. That's innovation. So he was struggling through several years of benchmarking uh, report outs that didn't change much. And he fired the chief human resources officer. And in the following meeting, he said, you know, the numbers had moved. He goes, well, you noticed I got rid of Miss Do Nothing. This is the CEO in a room full of other people and outsiders saying Miss Do Nothing. So think about it. It both does go back. You have to make the chickens come home to roost and be accountable for that. The second thing is, is mentoring. And I don't mean arm around the shoulder, formal mentoring. I mean structured mentoring that is tracked. It's trained for. You hold people accountable for it. You measure it before and after. Make sure you're moving the needle. I was in a debrief where somebody said, well, we here at XYZ Company have a culture of mentoring. We mentor. That's what we do. And I said, you know, I'm sure you're right. And you may be the one company that flies in the face of all of the data we've collected for all of these years that says it doesn't happen without discipline mentoring. It may be. Statistically speaking, it could be possible that you are the exception to the rule. And the CEO started shaking his head like this. And the answer is, nobody's the exception to the rule. This has to be enforced. You have to be disciplined. And I can't tell you the number of times we have mathematically showed people that they didn't have enough senior executives in mentoring to cover all the people that needed to be mentored. Because the CEO had not put his or her foot down and said, no, you're going to do mentoring. That is part of your job. And we are going to watch how you mentor, and we're going to track the success of your mentees, because that is part of your job. If you don't do that and you're not measuring it, it's not going to get done. You know, you, you'll want it on your list. You've got your list of things to do. And you've got 20 things on that list. And you'll get to the top three or four, and that's it. So you have good intentions, but until it's disciplined, it doesn't happen. And then finally, uh, resource groups. 
Resource groups are not affinity groups. They're not for food festivals and music things. Um, you should be utilizing them to solve business problems and help you with recruiting. Um, th there's, there's a whole bunch of information on Diversity Inc. Best Practices is my other website. It requires a subscription. There's a whole bunch of information about that there. Um, so I want to talk one more thing about supplier diversity. It was spoken about at the first presentation. Look at the difference between the top 50, the top 10, and the Hall of Fame, the percentage of uh, procurement. Now, that's a pretty amazing number, Hall of Fame. It takes a real dedicated emphasis on the subject. Um, and it's an interesting thing. We measure now second tier supplier diversity. First tier is your procurement spend. Second tier is the procurement spend of your top suppliers. And at first, we were getting no data from a lot of companies until we told people, you're not, you can't even make the top half of the list unless you give us second tier supplier diversity numbers. We have four sections in, of, of, that we evaluate. The supplier diversity is 25%. So all of a sudden, I said, this is a real easy thing to solve. You have your CEO call the top three people you're buying stuff from and say, we need your numbers, and you're not helping me unless you get me those numbers. I'd like them by Friday, please. You'll get them. You'll get them. And it encourages, when you think about Akron and, and, and investing in the local economy here and helping local entrepreneurs become successful, there really isn't much more, anything more important for your economic development than, than encouraging supplier diversity. Now, Ohio is an interesting place. Um, I have spent a lot of time in this state over my business career, uh, mostly in Cleveland. But if you look, this is from Enrico Moretti's book, and the up arrows or the up triangles are attracting more skilled immigrants than average, and the down arrows are less skilled immigrants than average, and the circles are, are equally weighted. Take a look at Ohio. W would you have guessed that your state is attracting more skilled immigrants than average? I didn't realize it was that good. I would have guessed it because of your, the kinds of industry that's in Ohio, but boy, that's really something, isn't it? I mean, you're as good as Texas. Think about that. Now, I want to give you a kind of a historical insight. In 1898, a professor from Ohio State wrote a book about the Underground Railroad. And in that book, and I have a first edition copy of it, there's a fold-out map. In red are the routes of the Underground Railroad. Look where they all are. They go through Ohio. I would tell you that this state has a legacy, and it has muscle memory of seeing people as human beings and extending out an arm and opening a door to people fleeing for their lives. And I would tell you to embrace that part of your history and you will help your economic development grow because you will attract the right people and they will stay. But there are levels of accountability that you have to weave into this. So your CEOs are not here. They need to be here at the next meeting. And the CEOs, your CEOs need to hold their, their process accountable. If they have a Miss Do Nothing as Chief Human Resources Officer or a Mr. Do Nothing, they need to know that they need to make a switch on that so that their process is accountable. There's talented people out there, and all of the companies in this area should be invested in their community colleges and their universities in the region to make sure that they're as healthy as possible. I have probably 40 years of combined um, uh, board experience in higher education. Uh, I was on the board, I was a, a trustee of a historically black college. I'm on the foundation board of a, of a Hispanic serving institution. I have an honorary PhD from both probably the only white guy you'll ever see with that, you know, on his resume. Um, I was also named an honorary black woman at Spelman College, which was, <laughs> which was really cool. So let's talk a little bit about authentic leadership, because that's what we're talking about here. This is a picture of me with my CEO, and Alex Gorski, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, with his chief diversity officer. Um, Johnson & Johnson is an incredibly interesting company. They have, and you can look this up, they have a thing they call the Credo, C-R-E-D-O. It's their um, one-page statement of corporate values. And it is a decision-making matrix, if you look at it properly. So the very first line is, we serve 
we first serve are the patients, the doctors and nurses who take care of them. So, and then it goes down the list. It's, you know, community, um, uh, employees, community, and then shareholders. Because if they do everything above the shareholders line properly, the shareholders will receive a good return on their investment. So when I first met with Alan Skorsky in his office, now he's a West Point grad. We were on active duty at the same time. And so that was the first thing I said, which made an immediate connection. Um, and we had a nice conversation. In front of his desk, the credo was etched in glass on a giant panel that went from floor to ceiling. And I said, that's, that's pretty impressive. And he goes, my predecessor didn't have that there. I have that here. And I said, well, I've always seen this as a great statement for diversity because it, it says patients, not white patients, patients. And he goes, that's right. Every patient, everybody, everybody's included. And that's how Johnson & Johnson runs itself. Now, his chief diversity officer, Wanda, is an absolutely no flinching, no politicking, straight shooter. And she helps Alex stay on track and helps give him that Tony Cato experience, who Tony gave, that's Tony, the guy, the pilot in the recruiting district. He helps him, she helps him have those experiences regularly. That's a very important thing. Now, my CEO, I hired as a junior level marketing person. And at one point, she said to me, I, I'm afraid that all you think when you see me is a young person. I said, well, you are young. And she laughed. She goes, yeah, you're right. So I said, I was an aircraft commander, a functional check pilot, and could sign for nuclear weapons when I was 27 years old. Now, reflecting on that, I don't know what in the hell anybody was thinking, but um, <laughs> I could do all of those things. I said, so don't think that young people can't have responsibility, because I don't believe that. I think you can have responsibility. So she's running the company now. I don't know that a four foot 11 black woman would be the CEO of any company in Akron, but I would tell you if I had three Carolyns, I would be the governor of the state of Florida and of Alabama and Georgia too. She, she's better than I ever was on my best day. And so we have financial conversations. I'm a, I'm a good chairman. I know to stay the heck out of the way. I don't talk to my former employees anymore directly. I won't talk to them because I don't want anybody asking me a question. They should be asking her or trying to get information out of me that they can then use in a conversation with her. I won't do it. So guess what? The company's doing real well. And I want to give you a little bit because we're here to talk about business and economic development. I'm an $11 million company. We have a 60% margin, 60. Now, that's pretty darn good. I have almost a million dollars revenue per employee. Now, if any company out there can match those numbers in the audience, we ought to get together and discuss you know, what we're doing because everybody would like those numbers. Everybody would. So think about it. I didn't, thank you. I didn't get there on my own. I had Carolyn. And, you know, guess what? My employees think they're diverse. I don't think there's two of anybody. But the bottom line is I attracted people who loved this subject. And because they loved this subject, they work very hard. And because we have such a diverse group, we're extremely in innovative. And that's how you get ahead in business. My procurement if I can't find a minority-owned or black-owned or veteran-owned, I'm also disability-owned certified, my company is, um, company, then we'll look outside of that circle for other, for services that we can't find from those groups. But if you look, the overwhelming majority of my procurement is from companies that are counted in supplier diversity categories. So I would tell you that I'm okay, I mean, I wasn't a, a, a fighter pilot, cargo helicopters, so I wasn't the brightest bulb on the string, according to the Navy. I was okay, but I, was, I wasn't far out to the... To I'm really, I do really fabulously well. Why? Because I have a really innovative team that works very hard, and we are all in it together, and this subject, this subject is about human liberation, and there is nothing more powerful on Earth than liberating human beings. So I spend all of my time and my money, philanthropy money, on making sure that poor people, poor children, have access to higher education. I have put, I don't even know how many hundreds of people through school. I don't even know. 
I get phone calls all the time. I got a phone call from a woman. I did it. I said, what'd you do? And she said, you don't remember? And I said, no, fill me in. She goes, you interceded to make sure that I stayed in a PhD program and I have my PhD in criminology. I was like, oh, now I remember, sure. I help, I pick up the phone or I send an email so many times that I don't know how many people, plus we have a program that I think that Akron should emulate. It's called Rector's Future Scholars. We take eighth graders who are selected by their schools to be having high potential. We mentor them until they graduate uh, high school. And if they're academically qualified, they go to Rutgers for free. We've put 2,600 kids through the program, over 90% success rate in graduating high school, and over 90% success rate in graduating four-year college. So think about this. <laughs> These were just average kids. But I will tell you the difference. So I know there's two, Robert and I discussed this, there's two counties that, in this area that are dominant. One is where mostly white people live, and one is where mostly non-white people live. So you look at this, and I, I, I couldn't find the school statistics, but I would lay out any amount of money anybody would wish to cover that the school district in Akron, in the city, is not as good as that suburban school district. Now, the kids are fairly equal. What's the difference? Well, there's preparation and there's stress. So when we were living in Princeton, believe it or not, a third of the kids going to the public school qualified for a subsidized lunch. So there was a fund that paid for after school activities and summer camp for these kids. And my wife ended up running the fund. And she came home and she said, I can't get even a $10 donation out of the PTO. What do you think that's about? I said, I don't have to think about it. I know what it's about. It's about racism. Those ponytail blonde women do not want those brown and black kids in their after school activities. And she said, I think so too. What are we going to do about it? So I said, well, let's write a check for $2,500 and challenge the rest of the parents. By the end of the week, she had four more checks for $2,500. One from a family we knew couldn't afford it. And today, the woman who was running the PTO is now running that fund because it raises more money than the PTO. Or all she is is a popularity hound, and that's what she's after. So she wants to be the superstar. So a lot more brown, black kids are going to summer camp, and it's fine, right? It all, all well that end well. But my point is, you've got to take care of your people. We found out through asking, there were people living in Princeton, New Jersey, with no refrigerator. A friend of mine figured out a thing. He, he, his, he and his wife keep a stroller in the back of their car, and when they see a woman walking down the street carrying a baby, they know this woman does not have enough money for a stroller. They pull over, give the woman the stroller, and buy a new stroller from Target. Think about the things that you can do in this community. You know, people, wealthy people, people in the middle class, you don't know what it's like to be hungry, and I don't know how many people how many of these little kids go home and they're hungry the next day when they show up for school? Think about this, that 91% uh, white police force. You get a ticket, you get a warrant, you lose your license, you got to pay to get the license back, you're on this treadmill forever of paying $200 fines that you can't afford. Something's got to give. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot of stress. So authentic leadership takes your results as an indictment if that's what they are. If you're not recruiting, retaining a mix of people that reflect the talent pool that's out there, if you're not engaging people, if your innovation's not good, and you don't accept that as your responsibility, you're not being authentic. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I've been um, um, serving the Navy as a volunteer for the last 14 years at the Chief of Naval Operations level. So the, the last Chief of Naval Operations who just retired, John Richardson, um, had me as his special advisor for talent development and diversity, which that and five dollars will get you a cup of coffee at any Starbucks. But um, one day he told me a great story. So there were very kind of arbitrary requirements for black women's hair for, the, for sailors, black women sailors. And there was a constant problem. It kept bubbling up in the press over the, over the years. And finally it came out in the press. And, so the CNO went into his office and got all of his black sailors together. He said, would you please, I need some advice, come into my office. He sat around his conference table and he said, what is it with the hair? Could you please ins instruct me because I don't know. Um, he's kind of hair challenged himself. But the bottom line, 
the women said, we are going to be bald after a career, and the regulation is written so loosely that if somebody has a problem because I, you know, I'm a black woman, they could pick on something with my hair even though I've tried my best to stay in the regulation. He changed the regulations that afternoon. It was a big surprise for everybody in the fleet. He told me the next week on Sunday, he goes out and runs outside the Navy Yard and comes back, but he stops at the same coffee shop every week. He goes into the coffee shop and he said, I have never been there in uniform, and it's not like I wear a sandwich board ringing a bell saying, I am the United States Navy. He walks in, and the woman behind the counter, black woman, points at him and said, you're the guy who fixed the hair, aren't you? Now that's pretty cool, right? Think about that. It's not, you're the, the admiral, the top admiral in the mightiest navy the planet has ever seen in its known history. You're the guy who fixed the hair. What do you think he feels more proud about? He's proud of that story. So that's a result of authentic leadership. He's getting a problem, it resurfaces, he goes, I don't understand this, I need to talk to somebody who does. And then I need to take action. You know he got email from the bigots saying, you know, how dare you relax, we have standards in the Navy, how dare you relax. You know he got those kinds of emails. And I will tell you, in this environment, in this environment right now, nationally, um, and I will tell you that being white is interesting, and being in this field is interesting, because when I go to a restaurant with my wife, nobody knows I'm Diversity Inc. So you hear the unfiltered white people talk. And when President Trump was running for president, I started hearing things in public that I had never heard before. Racist, bigoted, horrible language. It's out there, it's repetitive. I can't believe some of the crap people just tell me. People just tell me this stuff. And it's like, they don't know me. They don't know who I am. They don't know that my two children are immigrants. They're adopted from China. They don't know that. They don't know that I have gay people and my loved ones in my family. They don't know that. They don't know that my godchild is a black girl. They don't know that. But they'll tell me this racist, horrible stuff because I look like them, so they assume I'm in the circle. You've got to be aware that this stuff is out there, and you've got to confront it. And my CEO said, if you tell me you support Trump, you're telling me you hate who I am. Now think about that. And I don't care what your politics is, but bigotry is bigotry and hatred is hatred. And cruelty is cruelty. And we can do better than that. This state can do better than that. There it is. This state has done better than that. You can do better than that. This state is pivotal in the presidential elections. Did you know that there's a half a million Latinos that did not vote in Florida who could have? Did you know that the president, law, or the president won the Electoral College by less than 80,000 votes? And if Hillary had just paid attention to Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee, she would be president today. So let's think about this. Reverend Jesse Jackson will tell you the history of every presidential election since Hubert Humphrey, how every single one of them would have been different. Al Gore would have been president, Humphrey would have been president, Hillary Clinton would have been president. All of these people would have been president had they cultivated the black vote. And a white view would say, well, why don't those lazy black people get up and left butts and vote? And the answer is, because what's in it for them? There's got to be in it, something in it for you. And that's up to everybody in this audience to make sure that we all know there is something in it for us and help the people who don't have strollers get to the polling place get your cars and your little school buses and vans and get people back and forth and make sure when the rumor goes out that they're going to be checking for warrants, which is not the case, that people know that that's not the case. So the, the things that work here, sponsorship is different than mentoring. Sponsorship is the political capital you use to say, well, Robert is going up for this promotion or, wants, or should be in this job. He doesn't even know it's going to happen. And I'm advocating for Robert, because I've known Robert, and Robert will do a great job. That's the political capital that you expend for people. Now, let me ask you something. Well, I'll tell you. Princeton, right? My, I come home one day, my wife goes, we have no idea what we're doing as parents. I said, whoa, whoa, you know, <laughs> that's pretty bold. Why do you say that? She goes, these kids with the three generations of Princeton graduates in the house bombarding their kids with experiences and, and culture and and how to do things, 
and we don't, we don't even know about this stuff. Most of us don't know about the stuff that Ivy League parents know about. Most of us. Think about it. Be purposeful. Sponsorship cannot be assigned like you can assign somebody to be a mentee. It can be, um, it can be assigned. Um, so I could, as a CEO, say, you know what, Robert? You need to find five people to sponsor. You need to tell me who they are. And if you don't know anybody but white men, here's a list of resource group meetings. Go make some friends. Because we're going to talk about this in six months. And if you want to be a senior vice president at wherever company you're at, you have to be good at managing people. And this is part of it. So we have mentoring, advocates, advancement, allies. Are you going to be a good ally? Now, I would assume everybody in this room is interested in being an ally. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here in this meeting. But can you teach other people how to be a good ally? And it will be the kind of thing where you're going to have to pull some people aside and say, you know that joke? Don't do that anymore. You know that what you just said at that meeting? That's not a good thing to say. You know, let's talk about this a little bit. You have to cultivate people. This subject is not about being nice to people, although it is about being nice to people. It's about money. It's about money. It's about profitability. It's about innovation. It's about lifting the Akron area economically so that you can compete with the rest of this country and the planet because things are evolving so quickly with technology, you can attract the right people here. Now, years ago, Richard Canada wrote a bunch of books about how you have to have coffee shops and cool housing and people will come. It didn't prove out to be the case. I believe you have to have the, the, the outbound public relations, the reputation of striving to be a more fair place. And the best example, and I suggest you study this, in this country right now is Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee was very early out of the gate with laws protecting their LGBT citizens. They were a very progressive city in a not very progressive state. If any of you have been to Memphis, it's a tough place to be if you're black. But Nashville is attracting all sorts of companies, and they're, they're doing that because they have made a concerted effort to tell the whole world we are fair. We are fair to our citizens equally, and we want you to come here and, and go to, to the different um, attractions for music, and we want you to come here to work. And it works. Companies are not going to move their businesses to places where they know that their black people are going to get pulled over by the police, or their women don't have opportunities, or their students are not prepared to work. They're not doing that. I'll give you one more story, and I'll let you ask some questions. I was at a meeting at a humongous bank. I mean, it's a big bank, hundreds of thousands of employees. And the CEO at the time, he's not CEO anymore, would start off, I was always invited every year for their big diversity council meeting, big annual diversity council meeting. They met regularly, but they rolled up all of the people who were not in this city to fly in for this one meeting a year. And it was right after Ferguson, and the CEO gave his talk. He's a very polite man, a very nice man, a kind-hearted man, a man who was passionate about this subject, but he did not talk about the burning issue of the day. He had one black man directly reporting to him in the room. He raised his hand and said, I won't say the guy's first name because I don't want this to get back to him. I'll say Ralph. Ralph, we have to talk about race. You have to say the word. I've been working for this bank for the past 10 years in Los Angeles, and 10 times I've been pulled over and had a gun pointed at me because I'm driving around and I'm black. Now, this is a guy who's reporting to the CEO of this gigantic bank. I can't even imagine what kind of car he has. And yet this cop feel entitled to pull a pistol out and point it at this guy. Now, I've never had that experience. I've pulled some whoppers in the car. So you think about this. You can't have the reputation as a city who does this. You know who's moving to St. Louis? Nobody. Everybody's moving out. Don't get yourself in that position. Make sure your schools are tuned up. Make sure your police, and I'm not saying you've got a bad police force. I don't know, but 91% doesn't tell me that it's, you know, things could be better. Thank you for watching SGTV, socially good television. Visit sociallygoodtv.com and remember to share this video.